So our next uh, speaker is a uh, well-known leader in interventional cardiology, uh, Dr. Bill O'Neill, who is uh, leading the uh, Structural Heart Disease Program at Henry Ford uh, Hospital. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful to be here. And again, I want to thank uh, Noam and uh, the AbbeyMed group and, uh, and uh, Naveen for putting this together. It's been uh, really incredibly uh, stimulating intellectually to be involved with the ACUR group. And I think this is really going to be one of the huge uh, unmet uh, needs of the future. Um, I want to give you a, um, a little bit of a background um, about this talk. So about a week and a half ago, I was playing uh, uh, Jason Bourne on my boat, and I was jumping from one boat to another, and then I just wrenched my back, and I really killed it. And uh, I couldn't do anything. I mean, my, I, I really pulled my back muscle, and I just had to be like flat in bed, bed rest for like two days, and then it finally started getting better. And so, you know, God is a wonderful bioengineer, and so he figures that if you, uh, if you sprain or hurt a muscle, the best thing to do is to rest it, right? I mean, if you rest it, then it'll heal and get better, uh, which would be wonderful to do for, our, for, for a heart. But your heart can't rest, so you, you, you occlude the coronary artery, and you had low blood pressure, and then all the body systems are telling you to try to go ahead and perfuse harder, and you're just, uh, you're just whipping that, that dead horse. It's, it's kind of like uh, here in Rome back in, you know, 2,000 years ago, there were the Roman galleys, and uh, these poor uh, slaves were being whipped by, you know, you saw Ben-Hur, and they'd be on the galleys, and, and their backs would be killing them. I was thinking to myself, God, if my back was like that, being on a galley, and I had this, this guy whipping me in the back, I'd be really killing myself. And then, uh, wouldn't it be great if you could just put an outboard boat motor on the back of that boat? Then you could all rest, and you could just go forward. So I think it really is, uh, the impel is like an outboard motor for some poor slave who's injured his back on a galley. But uh, anyway, going forward, so my talk. This is, uh, th this is a historical slide from uh, Killip in 1967 on the outcome of uh, around 200 patients that were admitted to New York Hospital in cardiogenic shock. And you can see that the mortality of cardiogenic shock uh, is 90% at one week. Uh, more importantly, it's 50% mortality within 12, 10 hours of the onset of shock. So this is, a, this is a dramatically, rapidly lethal condition. And we just simply have to equip our systems of care to do a better job of taking care of these patients and getting them to appropriate care faster. And that's really going to be the theme of my, my discussion. Uh, 30 years ago, we published this data from the University of Michigan experience on the first outcome of angioplasty therapy for cardiogenic shock, compared it uh, to patients uh, treated between 1983 and 1985, and then 1985 we started our angioplasty program and we saw that there was a significant improvement in survival and that at 30 days there was a 50% survival. Now this is the first series published in angioplasty therapy and uh, disappointingly, 30 years later, the outcome is still a 50% survival. So although we've made major leaps and advances in reperfusion therapy for shock has been a huge 1A indication. Uh, we really need to go further with this, and still 50% you know, is just not acceptable, and uh, we have to figure out a way to get, uh, to get this, this better. Now, there are therapies that people are trying. Some, some work, some don't. So this is now the use of ECMO, the European Experience in Cardiogenic Shock, and you can see that the patients overall have a 20% survival with ECMO. So this therapy does not seem to be effective, and I think that uh, we've had a lot of discussions about use of, the, of these devices, and we heard some elegant uh, information this morning about the increase in afterload and the negative experience that this happens on the heart, and I think that this is something that just isn't going to work. A uh, balloon pump has been shown, again, to be completely ineffective. So if we're going to be looking at mechanical strategies, you have to look at strategies other than those, too. Uh, Mark mentioned the CVAD registry, and, and this is really a wonderful opportunity. And for all of the, you who are involved, I think this is a great way of being able to look at outcome data from the real world. Now it's an international registry with participants in North America, Europe, and um, more recently in Japan, and this is all going to be prospective data that's going to be collected at the participating institutions. It's all quality assured. It's all outcome reviewed by a CC, and I think it's going to be really very, very sound data that is going to be very similar to the data from the TVT registry and from the LA registry, and going to be a method going forward for us to be able to look at outcome data uh, in a community environment. 
The, uh, the, the device, that, and we've talked a great deal about this in terms of how it works. So uh, basically, the way that it, it would work for cardiogenic shock is going to increase uh, cardiac power, uh, increase mean arterial pressure. Uh, more importantly, in terms of myocardial uh, dynamics and functions, you're going to decrease LVDP, decrease wall tension, decrease mechanical work. So you're basically increasing the oxygen supply and decreasing the demand at the time of acute myocardial injury. And I think this is really the reason why uh, this device has such potential promise for improving outcomes in these patients. This is a patient that uh, we treated at our institution. Uh, he had a total occlusion of the right coronary artery, and then we did a balloon angioplasty of the left main LED circumflex. And we left, and I, I purpose, this is it with an impella in place, and I left the, 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 uh, the angioplasty balloon up purposely. And you can see on the right-hand side of the, the equation, uh, the aortic pressure and the right ventricular pressure. And as the balloon continues to be inflated within a few heartbeats, the heart stops contracting and you have a, 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 a basic flow, but the flow is, is, is so the mean flow is 100 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, interestingly, the right heart pressure still contracts, so although there's no blood flow to the heart, the right heart is still beating and the left heart has stopped contracting, but you've been able to completely take over the circulation of this patient, keep the patient systemically perfused while the heart isn't working. And I think that's really the, the important advantage of this device in terms of uh, the outcomes for patients in cardiogenic shock. We can completely take over the circulation of the patient and systemically perfuse them. Now this is the data from the 287 patients. I, these are very small and I apologize, but I'll just briefly go through this. Uh, the 287 patients then, we divided them between survivors and non-survivors. Uh, you can see that the mean arterial pressure was 70, the wedge was 30, cardiac index 2.2, and, and all of those really show that these patients were truly in, in, in very severe uh, hemodynamic compromise uh, with marked elevation of lactates. And so this is, uh, this is actually a patient of uh, true cardiogenic shock. Um, if we look at the outcome based on the use of inotropes, uh, if, if the patients had no inotropes it started and er, support started early, 70% survival. And then with increasing types and numbers of inotropes, the more outcomes, the, the more inotropes that were used, the worse the survival. And, and this is really something that I think we really have to start honing in to the cardiology community. Uh, inotropes are a poison for the heart, especially in the setting of an acute infarction. They're going to maximize oxygen consumption without doing any, anything to increase uh, myocardial blood flow. And as a result, they're going to largely increase the size of the infarct in, in, in a time and environment where it's absolutely essential that, uh, that not, that not happen. So I think this is really going to be something that we all have to re-educate folks to. And I think that consideration for need of inotropes should be a trigger for use of, of, of mechanical hemodynamic support. We looked at, 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 at the time as a function, survival as a function of when uh, the support started. In, in the first turistile of patients, they, they had from the onset of shock to support was an hour and a half, and then between an uh, hour and a half and four hours in the middle, and then greater than four hours. So if, if the shock occurred and was longer than four hours in duration before hemodynamic support occurred, there was only a 26% survival. And so there's a very steep gradient of survival based on how long the shock happens. And I think that this is something, again, we all have to really under, understand and educate it. And, and to me, the frustration that I have currently working in our environment is I think people are waiting too long to transfer. They're, they're sitting in their hospitals. They, pay, they do a primary angioplasty. The patients, maybe blood pressure's 100. They put them on a little inotrope, and then they start escalating the dose of inotrope. And then a day later, you get the call. You know, the patient's in shock. I got a balloon pump and uh, help me. And, and by that point, the patient has, has gone into a spiral of irreversible shock. So you can get the hemodynamic supported, but they'll die of renal failure, they'll die of, of, of CNS injury, or they'll die of liver failure. So other organs, in, in these elderly patients, there's always one end organ that's the, the weak link. Can't tell which it is. It might be the brain, it might be the liver, it might be the kidney, it might be the bowel. But one of those is going to crap out when they're in prolonged shock, and they develop irreversible end organ injury. So even if you can save the heart, you're not going to be able to save the patient. So I think that we really have to start pushing to get patients supported quicker. And that's really the, the message that I'd hope to, 
to leave you with. Um, we looked at outcome data based on whether or not the patients had the device implanted before the reperfusion or after. Uh, we've been telling people for about three years that it's probably better to put the device in first. And you can see now that there's some really good data to suggest that the outcome is actually quite a bit better if the patients are, uh, are treated with, uh, with, 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 with the hemodynamic support first, and then the, the, the device. So currently in our algorithm, uh, we have a consortium now uh, in, in southeastern Detroit. We have, the, we have the Detroit Cardiogenic Shock Consortium. We have all five major institutions agreeing that when we, when, he, when we have a patient coming to our cath lab in cardiogenic shock, the very first thing that we do is we get ephemeral access and put the impella in. That's the very first thing that we do. And then after that, we'll do a right heart cath, and then after that, we'll do the coronary angiogram, and then do the reperfusion. But uh, the whole point is that I think we really have to move the window much more aggressively uh, toward getting support sooner. And the sooner the patients can get supported, the quicker they can be, uh, they, they, they can be improved. Uh, yesterday, just before I flew out, uh, I had a patient that were transferred to us. He came into an outlying hospital at 6.30 in the morning, in cardiogenic shock, blood pressure 60. Uh, they put a balloon pump in, and at 7 o'clock, they transferred him to us. We got him at 8 o'clock, and we had the impel in by 8.30. So the time from onset of shock to mechanical support was two hours. Uh, we were able to fix a subtotally occluded vein graft, and as of this morning, he's awake and ambulating and getting ready for discharge. So we can, we can entirely change the natural history of this disease if we can get these patients treated and supported quicker. So I think that uh, the, the, the message, the simple message that I'd like to leave for you is that I think we have to really change the paradigm. We've been, we've been I think, a very good at changing mechanism for door-to-balloon balloon time. And I think that hospitals and institutions have really figured out ways of being able to do this. Uh, and uh, what Elizabeth Bradley uh, pointed out in the New England Journal was that um, if you have champions at your institution that are really willing to go and see what the barriers and obstacles are to getting these patients to the, to the cath lab soon and get the artery perfused, uh, this door to balloon is in a little bit of um, conflict with what we're talking about putting in the impella before we reperfuse in shock. Uh, we looked at the data and it, di it did add uh, 27 minutes to um, uh, delay in the reperfusion time by putting the impel in first, but that was really completely uh, uh, changed by the outcome in terms of, of improvement in survival. So obviously the, the clinical trial that, uh, that uh, Naveen is trying to put together is, is going to be crucial in trying to figure out whether or not scientifically there is my, much more myocardial salvage, but I think in the shock patients, putting in the impella immediately gets the patients hemodynamically stable so that you can kind of calmly do whatever else you need to do. I think it's mandatory to put a right heart catheter in, and uh, there's data from the impella registry, from the commercial registry, showing that there's a real strong correlation between the use of of right heart catheterization and outcome in patients in cardiogenic shock. So getting them supported, then figuring out the anatomy, I think is going to be the way that we're going to change the paradigm. But we have to do something differently than we've done for the last 30 years. Uh, angioplasty has been very helpful. Stents have not improved survival. Glycoprotein receptor blockers haven't improved survival. Uh, beta blockers have not improved survival in cardiogenic shock. So if we're going to move the ball forward, again, it's probably 10% of our population, but it's an increasingly higher percentage of patients that die because of acute MI or dying because of acute MI and cardiogenic shock. So I think that this is really where we're going to have to go forward with this. Uh, I, I welcome the opportunity to talk to this group. Uh, I, I love being part of this, and, and I love uh, you know, listening and interacting with all of you. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bill. And as people come to the microphones, a couple of questions. So there are two populations. And the first, and uh, in the morning session, they say they said it was easy. The shock population, we don't have good outcomes. MCS uh, is an option. So we don't have randomized data yet in the shock population as well. So my first question is uh, between this shock population and the other population, which uh, Elazer uh, described as the gray area, 
the high risk acute MI population that also is going to end up with heart failure if they survive and they survive, they have good outcomes. Which is the priority in your opinion to move forward and do an acute MCS trial? Yes, we, we lack randomized data in both of these uh, subgroups. We looked, at, um, we looked at the cardiogenic shock patients that were in the, uh, in the uh, registry, in the CVAD registry, and 55% uh, of those patients couldn't be in randomized trials. If you take a look at the inclusion exclusion criteria for the shock trial, uh, uh, half of the patients had out of hospital cardiac arrest. 15% uh, of the patients were having active CPR while they had the impella placed. And so a big portion of the shock patients, you, you're just simply not going to be able to have the time to talk to the patient or their family to be able to consent them in a trial. So I'm not sure whether or not randomized trials are the way to study full-blown acute cardiogenic shock. I think these uh, outcome registries where you systematically try one therapy may be a better way to, to treat those patients. I think in in the other, in the high-risk, uh, large infarct group, they're a little more stable, and it'll be a little easier to study. But um, we'll see. I mean, we'll see what the, what the data shows. We're going to be following this, uh, uh, and, and we'll, over time, as, this, uh, a, as the CBAD registry continues, we'll take a look at time points today, a year from now, two years from now. And what I expect will happen is that we're going to see a higher and higher proportion of patients having uh, uh, mechanical support before reperfusion, and then we'll see if the outcome actually gets better. Five years from now, if, if, if you tell me that 90% uh, of the patients have, have uh, reperfusion, uh, have support before reperfusion, and it still is a 50% mortality, I think that's going to be pretty convincing. I won't need a randomized trial to tell me that. Uh, I, I can just make a comment on the how difficult it is to enroll patients in shock trials. We are in Denmark trying to randomize patients with STEMI and shock pre-PCI, and we don't want patients with uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest mm -hmm. in the study. And to get 50 patients randomized, you need more than 3,000 STEMIs. So we are able to randomize 1.7 to 2% of the STEMI population. So it's probably the most difficult study in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the second question is on the high risk population who is going to have a good 30 day survival outcome, but it's going to end up with heart failure and burden the system later that we are also discussing about myocardial salvage. Yeah. How are you going to define in this future trial the high risk? We talked in the morning, uh, the feeling pressures are not going to tell you that. We saw this in the animals, sometimes we see it in the humans. Is it going to be just the location of the lesion in the LAD? Is it going to be surrogates of high risk? No, we did that. We did that in, in the original PAMI trial. Actually, the Timmy group, uh, Brunwald and, and their group did it. They call it uh, high risk and not high risk. So it, it's, it's really very simple. Age over 70, heart rate greater than 100, anterior myelocation. It's a very simple clinical, that's, that defines a high risk group. So if you're young and have an inferior infarct and your heart rate's not high, you've got like a 1% mortality. So, and that's about half of the population. So I think you can just use clinical parameters. Uh, Naveen is looking at large anterior infarcts as sort of a very uh, homogeneous subset to study, but that's where I would go. The next step, if this works in shock, would be to, to treat all these uh, high-risk clinical patients, uh, anterior MI, age over 70, admission tachycardia. Th those people have a 10% hospital mortality with uh, primary angioplasty. Thank you.